What is going on, everybody? It's the Fox, and we're here for Unscripted, episode number 116 for your Sunday, April 26th, 2020. We are almost done with the month of April, and hopefully almost done with this pandemic bullshit. Now, as some things have been going on, as we know, the XFL is gone, done, out of here. Child filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Vince McMahon killed his league for no other reason than he... Honestly, in my opinion, was reacting to the times. With everything that's going on, he had a knee-jerk reaction, folded the league, put it in bankruptcy, and just all the hopes and dreams of all those guys who played, who did not make it to the NFL, are gone again. And yesterday, Kenny Robinson of the St. Louis Battlehawks, who was the only college-eligible player in the XFL, was drafted in the fifth round to the Carolina Panthers, showing that the XFL was a great idea for everybody. Speaking of the XFL, today, tonight, would have been the championship game in Houston, in Houston's home, in TDE, I think it's TCEDU Stadium, where the Roughnecks, where the Roughnecks played, would have been your championship game had none of this stuff happened. Kenny Robinson, of course, probably would have been in the St. Louis Battlehawks camp for the playoffs, the St. Louis Battlehawks were making the playoffs, no doubt about it. But things happened, the league folded, all of that. Kenny Robinson's off to the NFL. Many other teams, many other players from the XFL made it to the NFL. But just like the NBA G League, just like minor league baseball, just like the um, minor league hockey, there are players who are going to be in the XFL for life. If the XFL would have had a full season, made it to a second year, and was only continued to go on, money go into it, starts making money in the second or third year. There's a lot of people who are like, that's it. The XFL was their last stop. They weren't going to get to the NFL. The NFL is for the elite. The XFL is a way for people to get to the elite eventually, but not everyone's going to do that. A minor league system, which the NFL desperately needs, a lot of the guys were not going to get there. Just like the AAF before, just like whatever comes after, because the XFL is not going to be the final football league that we see in the spring. It's just not going to be. You have the Freedom Football League that's supposed, that was supposed to start this year, and I'm sure they scratched those plans. But there are guys out there who want to live that football dream as long as they can. So the XFL comes up. Yeah, they want to get they want to get that invitation so they can go out and play. If the FFL starts playing, they're going. If people get an invite to go play for that. Just because the other two failed, this one might stand because, hey, it's an opportunity for myself. Why am I bringing the XFL up again? Because all the luck sues Vince McMahon for going for termination and the fact that Vince McMahon told, like, agreed to a contract with all of the luck that no matter what happened to the league, whether it succeeded or flamed out and failed, he was owed $20 million. Vince McMahon, Vince McMahon reneged on that, fired him the day before the terminate before he terminated the league, and pretty much doesn't want to owe him the twenty million that he does. Now, as we should know, Vince McMahon is got one of those great lawyers. I'm sure this is not going. We're not going to see this go to court, where Oliver Luck's going to have all of these reasons why Vince McMahon is going to get fucked over, because apparently. The five hundred million that we were told that Vince McMahon put into the league because he took so much money out. He like when when the XFL first got started, the NA, the WWE stock was at ninety, was covering between seventy and ninety dollars a share. So he sold his shares, got a lot of money to put into the XFL. We were told that five hundred million was in this league for the next three years. Apparently. Only $44 million of that $500 million was put into the XFL. Where is the other $456 million that Vince McMahon was supposed to have for the XFL? That's my question. What did he do with that? On top of that, instead of, using, like, instead of putting the money into the league as he would, he, put, he like, loaned the league the money so he could be the top creditor so when this goes to bankruptcy, which it has, 
he can go out there and say and get as much of that money back as he can, if not more. Honestly, with everything that's going on, Vince McMahon, and I'm pretty sure somewhere in here, Vince McMahon, in his doings for the XFL, has done something highly illegal, will get caught for it, and it's going to fuck Vince McMahon up over completely. And quite honestly, I hope, I hope Oliver Luck sues Vince McMahon for everything he has, settles out of court, gets the rights to the XFL, could find a couple people invested in it, because there were a lot of good things about this version of the XFL. This one was doing everything right, at least we thought it was. And so you see the in, read in between the lines of what Vince McMahon was doing with the funds for the league, but everyone was getting paid. I do like the fact that they stopped after week five because of everything that happened on the 11th with Rudy Gobert going down with coronavirus and everyone getting shut, and the entire economy shutting down. They shut down as well. They had no choice. But they didn't bankrupt or fold the league immediately. They could have. They could have said, you know what? Vince McMahon could have said, you know what? We tried. Things went bad. We're going to fold the league. No. They waited until what would have been week 10. Or the play, what, what would have been week, the, week, the first playoff week. Everybody who was a player got their base salary paid for the entire regular season. Yes, that bonus check of you winning a game didn't get put in there because there were no games played. But I liked the, that was one thing I liked about this league is that they paid the players. This is not like the AAF who went out there and as soon as they folded in week eight said, you know what, fuck you people, we're just going to leave you high and dry. If you're stuck somewhere in a hospital, guess what, you have to foot the bill, we're not footing it anymore. And ended on such a bad note. They went out at least the first, the, after the season, they went out paid everybody, and everyone got, got what they should have gotten. I like that. Of course, when you go to the playoffs, your, your contract that you sign in something like this is for the, for the regular season. You're not guaranteed anything with the playoffs because how do you know your team's going to make the playoffs? I'm sure they get different things for when they go to the playoffs, but unfortunately, playoffs didn't happen. So playoffs were supposed to be last weekend. Tomorrow, tonight was supposed to be the championship game. We should be talking about, I should be going on here talking about how, man, this um, team here, versus, Team East versus Team West, they're going to be going into the playoffs tonight. I cannot wait till Tuesday to be able to go over this. Unfortunately, or Monday, whichever. But unfortunately, cannot do that because things happen. So, Oliver Luck suing, the X suing Vince McMahon. I don't think this is going to be the last lawsuit we hear about for the XFL. I just don't see it happening. But everything Vince McMahon did and how he screwed each and every one of these people... Um, from stadiums to vendors to personnel, player personnel, to everybody. He screwed so many people over. Even if, the 2001, when the XFL season ended and, and they had to, to sack the league, that wasn't Vince McMahon's fault. Vince McMahon at that time, if he would have had the league finish the season, he would have gone through hell or high water to keep that league going. Because... He saw something in it at that time, but unfortunately, it just wasn't going to happen. He had owned only 50%. The NBC Universal owned, NBC owned the second, other 50%. They wanted to close the league. Vince had no choice. So people didn't probably put it on Vince as much outside of the fact that it was a very bad thing. If they would have started in 2002 instead of 2001 after a two-year stunt, we probably see seeing the XFL with a couple name changes, mind you, because those names, a lot of those names just wouldn't fly in 2020. We probably would have seen the XFL go for a while, but unfortunately, that's just not what happened. But this time, with how the XFL ended, and how bad Vince McMahon treated everything, and how Vince McMahon just screwed so many people out of this, this job, I don't think this is going to be something that if Vince McMahon, say, five years from now, is like, let's do the XFL number 3.0. No. If someone else, like, the XFL name could be damaged forever, even if somebody bought it from Vince McMahon, found, found a bunch of investors and wanted to start it up again, I don't think it's going to have the same effect as it did this time. You had so much. You had, you had the beer snake in D.C. That was fucking amazing. You had a great commissioner, Oliver Luck. So many good players. So many players who are not going to get another chance in the NFL. So many players who didn't even get a chance to show that, hey, I deserve a chance in the NFL. 
So it's only five weeks. The second half of the season is usually where you see the people who aren't going to be here next season really shine. Outside, of course, P.J. Walker and all those who, in the first part of the season, there were going to be others that you say, boom, that person's a stud. They're not going to be here next year. But it didn't happen. Now, I promise, I'm hoping this will be the last time we talk about the XFL because, yes, it's out. It's, it's beating a dead horse. But if anything comes between Vince McMahon and Oliver Luck, I will let you know. WWE did their earnings call on Thursday, and Vince McMahon and WWE touted record numbers. They were, they, like, salary was up, six, like, 600% or something like that. I'm making the number up. But high up. That it just baffled people still that they cut so many people. UFC, in debt, hasn't cut anybody. Impact Wrestling has not cut anybody. Ring of Honor has not cut anybody. Ring, um, AEW has not cut anybody. Fucking hell, New Japan Pro Wrestling in Japan who relies on ticket sales and merchandise sales. They don't have a TV deal like WWE anywhere. I mean, yes, they have New Japan World, but I'm pretty sure they're not getting as much revenue from that as they would want to, are still paying full salaries to each and every one of their wrestlers and their benefits. None of these wrestling promotions have cut a single person, but WWE has cut talent after talent after talent after talent. They furloughed a bunch of people. It's just like, what the fuck? How can, how can the one company in combat sports, from WWE to UFC, AEW, Ring of Honor, Impact Wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling over in Japan, how can the one company that, doesn't, that isn't going to be losing money in this time is the only company that cut people? Can someone explain that one to me? Because I'm, I'm just kind of at a loss, the fact that WWE makes a ton of money does more business than anybody else and yet and yes they're going to hurt everybody's hurting from what's going on right now but they're not hurting as bad so like AEW could be losing like a million dollars a week oh um, uh, like uh, about five hundred dollars five hundred thousand a week WWE would be losing ten thousand yet AEW hasn't cut anybody possibly signed more people that we don't even know about but yet WWE is cutting talent Someone explain this one to me? Speaking of the uh, earnings calls, Vince McMahon was asked about the ratings. Why are the ratings down? Why is Monday Night Raw, SmackDown, and NXT, well, not NXT, but Raw and SmackDown, hurting in the ratings? Vince McMahon touted, well, Brock Lesnar's not there, so the ratings are going to go down because Brock Lesnar's not there. We have young talent on Monday Night Raw, so the ratings are going to go down because people aren't established yet. In a normal sense of things, if we actually had a live crowd, I could say yes, that would be a reason that the ratings were down. Because if you've never seen Austin Theory before, who the fuck is Austin Theory? You see him on your channel. He's not established yet. Why the fuck am I turning in to watch Austin Theory? He hasn't done anything for me yet. Angel Garza is still relatively new. What the hell am I supposed to tune in for him for? Bianca Belair just made her debut. If you're not an NXT viewer and you're a casual person, who the hell is she? Why should I be interested in her? Yet, he doesn't blame the li there being no live audience, even though other people, Eric Bischoff has come out and said that possibly WWE and AEW and Impact Wrestling, even though Impact Wrestling barely has an audience as it is, possibly driving people away more now than ever because of these empty arena shows. You need a crowd at these shows. I just saw on my phone that uh, earlier today, like five minutes before I started recording this, that the NBA is going to be opening up some practice facilities on May 1st, which is good. So things are starting to open up a little bit as we continue on. Will that make a difference in WWE sense? No. I'm just hoping when we get to May, which WWE is hopefully is talking about wanting to start touring in June. I hope it's going to be in the middle of May because I'm getting sick and tired of seeing empty arena shows. Did you see that shit with Shawn Michaels and Triple H and Vince McMahon on, on Friday? Vince McMahon was on I don't give a fuck mode 110%. There was just no fucking way Vince McMahon gave a fuck on Friday. So I honestly think Vince McMahon has been broken by what's going on in the um, world right now. I mean, look at this. Um, we're a couple weeks away from the biggest 
event of the year, WrestleMania, in Raymond James Stadium. We were in Washington, D.C., if I'm correct, the Monday before all this went down. We're just building. We have a couple weeks left. Vince McMahon is at the top where he wants to be. His football league is going. It, it's exceeding expectations, in my opinion, honestly. I think that's exactly the words it was, exceeding its expectations. And then in one fell swoop, WrestleMania has to be moved to the PC. The XFL put on hold. Just a deal that they were going to sign with ESPN to sell the pay-per-view rights of, the, of WrestleMania and everything else to ESPN+. Plus. So if you have the network, you're shit out of luck. But WWE and Vince McMahon, in one fell swoop, lost everything. Everything came crashing down in 24, in 24 hours. And that shit's gotta... That, if anybody in his position of being the head of a wrestling company or a head of a company who's trying to do a startup with something that he's wanted to do since the early 2000s. He wanted to get the XFL up so badly. Even in the, this was the XFL, um, 30 for 30 that they did a couple years, like in 2017, I think it was, he was having dinner with Dick Ebersol, and Dick asked him if he could do it again, he would, and Vince said, yes, yes, I would. Just do it a little bit different. But, so, he wanted to get this done. Obviously, it's not going to be where it wanted to be. And now, here he is, Vince McMahon, I swear, is probably a broken old man. Coming out, apparently there was somebody who asked somebody, what the hell was that Vince we saw last night, uh, on, on last night, because it was yesterday they asked this. And apparently this is the Vince McMahon we've seen backstage. He doesn't give a fuck anymore. He is just like, well... My fucking, my fucking world's gone crashing down. I lost my football league, even though he didn't have to fucking, he didn't have to close it down. Oliver Luck and his crew did, were exceeding expectations, so the XFL could have survived. The only reason the XFL got shut down is because of how everything's going down. Vince McMahon was afraid that in two years, mind you, two years, he couldn't get the TV deal that would make the XFL money. Now... The way the economy is gone and everything, maybe that's true. Maybe he couldn't get that deal. Maybe it would take another three, four years before the um, XFL could get that TV deal. And honestly, WWE, I mean, the XFL wouldn't have been able to survive past the third year. But they did rid of it, just made no sense. And dicking people over has really hurt Vince McMahon's reputation to... Even if Vince McMahon wants to do anything else other than WWE from here on out, nobody's going to trust him. Now, we've always, we've always joked, and everyone in the wrestling community has joked about the, like, anybody trying to take Vince McMahon out of his word in, the rest, in WWE should really... It, it's like a running joke trying to take the word of Vince McMahon when it comes to promises that he makes because they never get kept. So when something happens outside of WWE... In which Vince McMahon breaks, the pro breaks promises that he tried he couldn't keep. It, it's just something that we wrestling fans are used to seeing when you hear those stories of somebody stuck around because Vince McMahon promised this, and then six weeks later they're not happy because those promises aren't there anymore. Alberto Del Rio came back a couple years ago, and WWE promised him a world title run, and it never came to fruition, so he left. He was pissed because they brought him back, promised him all this shit, even though I wouldn't promise all but the W a damn thing, but they brought him back, they promised all this shit, and he, they didn't live up to the promises. Batista came back in 2013, right before, or 2014, right before the Royal Rumble, which should have been a surprise return at the Royal Rumble, as a heel, if they wanted him to win the Rumble, have him come back at the Rumble instead of, you know, a couple weeks earlier, hugging the authority... And trying to be a babyface at the same time did not work for the fans. But he came back. They promised him a WWE Championship run. He was supposed to go to WrestleMania. He was supposed to beat Mandy Wooden. And he was supposed to keep the championship from WrestleMania to at least SummerSlam. Being WWE Champion going to promote Guardians of the Galaxy. Batista realized after a while that that wasn't going to happen. So after, what was it, Payback? He said, you know what, I'm out of here, I want out, I ain't coming back. 
So that's why Batista is gone, and he like he left. He was signed to two year. He was supposedly signed a two year deal to work house shows and work other other things because unlike some rest, unlike some part timers, Batista wanted to do the entire thing: the house shows, the pay per views, everything. If he was going in, he was going to do a Chris Jericho, where he's not there just to do Raw or SmackDown. He's there to do the whole nine yards. But then everything went the way it was, and he left, and that was that. We didn't see Batista in a WWE ring again until last year at 35. Now, with all the releases we got last week, two of them stick out. Drake Maverick, because he was in the Cruiserweight Interim Championship Tournament, and Deanna Peraza. Now, Drake Maverick, when he got released, put a video out, emotional, just con- like just giving out his emotion of his feelings and everything, like he's the underdog and everything else. Then we fast forward to NXT this week, and of course, Drake Maverick is in the tournament still. Instead of, you know, doing the right thing and replacing him, WWE decides they're going to have... By the way, this is a round-robin tournament. This isn't a... Um, a, you know, single elimination tournament, which if they wanted to do this right, they could have had Drake Maverick come in, lose to Jake Atlas, and be done, and be out of here. But no, it's a round-robin tournament, so he's got at least two more matches. But they've taken this emotional video, and they played it. And now Drake Maverick feels like... It, and there's a lot of questions on the online, in the community, Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez as well, where it's like, is Drake Maverick... Signed with WWE, was this all a storyline for him to be fired, for them to give this guy some sympathy, to bring him into the Cruiserweight division? Because quite honestly, up until last week, Drake Ma- or the week before, Drake Maverick was the GM of the Cruiserweights, and he wasn't doing anything else. He wrestled one, maybe one match on, Mac- on 205 Live against Mike Kanellis, and then they, I think he had a match maybe on Raw with the Office of Pain. I could be wrong there. But it just felt like they are using this guy, and he's really not fired. They were just using that as a way to build sympathy for this guy. Yes, he lost to Jake Atlas. But what if? What if Drake Maverick wins match two and three? What if he wins match two and three to go to the finals? And what if Drake Maverick wins the interim Cruiserweight Championship? Who knows? I doubt it. I think he's going to lose all three because that's just what they're going to do. Which is what he should do. If he's leaving, he should be out. I also forgot to mention Sarah Logan, but we'll get to that in a second. Deanna Perrazzo. One, Deanna Perrazzo should have never signed a WWE. And two, Deanna Perrazzo was a victim of WWE not wanting her to go anywhere else. Three, she was supposed to be at All In. She really wishes she would have signed, and she was booked to go to All In and wrestle there. And probably be a part of that fatal four-way match that was out for the women which was a killer match with who was in who was in who was who with who was in it. And four, she wants to go to AEW to say or anywhere else to say screw WWE. Diana Carrazzo was signed to WWE. I believe she was in the May Young Classic 2018, if I'm correct. Right? 2018 May Young Classic. And she had what, one match in that tournament, if I'm correct. She was in she got eliminated in the first round. And they did nothing with her. Deanna Perrazzo was on the NXT roster for no other reason than they did not want her in AEW, Ring of Honor, or AEW didn't exist in 2018, get my drift. Ring of Honor, Impact Wrestling, or anywhere else that she was at. They did not want her anywhere. So she sat in the performance center, working on herself. She got used sparingly, getting beat, and then we didn't see her until a couple weeks ago, when she, uh, I think it was actually last year in December when she took on Charlotte in a losing effort. Then she came up again, I think she faced, before she faced Nia Jax, which was her last match. She faced, I think, Oscar or somebody else and lost to them, and then came up to face Nia Jax and lost in Nia Jax's return. She was a huge and massive victim of WWE and Vince McMahon's pettiness. She was signed to not go anywhere else, and it sucks. He now hopefully will go somewhere else. AEW looks like it might be a landing spot, possibly, and they could use a talent like Deanna Peraza, who is just somebody who never got a chance to shine, 
and it just shows every week, every day, that WWE should have never, ever started doing this thing with hoarding of talent. Because when you hoard talent and something sh- shit goes bad like it did with the env- with the co- economy, you have to let go of talent. And Deanna Perrazzo, from what I read, wanted her release from WWE because, honestly, frustration builds up. Why the fuck would you want to stay at home or in the performance center doing absolutely nothing, not having a chance to advance your career past anything, because Vince McMahon in WWE doesn't want you to go anywhere. So, Deanna Perrazzo, I hope to see you on AEW. If she shows up, and because AEW, which is another new story, because if AEW does what they say, that what, what is apparently being talked about with them, it will not surprise me, after her, not, her 30 day no to keep clause, to see Deanna Perrazzo on AEW television past the midway through, what was it? It was what? It was, one second here, it was the 15th is when everyone got released, so I'd say May 20th. If they have a live taping of AEW on May 20th from Daly's Place or wherever they're going to be at, especially if it's in Daly's Place because I'm sure she's been living in Florida the last few years, I could see Deanna Prowse driving her vehicle up to that Daly's Place, talking to Tony Khan, Cody Rhodes, Kenny Omega, Brandy Rhodes, and anybody else she has to, and having a match on AEW television and killing it. Look what Anna Jay did with, um, with um, Sheeta. That was her sixth match, by the way. Sixth match. So, it would be interesting to see what happens there. Before we get to the AEW stuff, Sarah Logan. What the fuck is going on with Sarah Logan as well? Sarah Logan was a victim of Black, of Black Wednesday. He was fired. It's funny because her husband is one of those carpool karaoke Vikings. Which, again, who the fuck thought that was a good idea? But WWE, in their grand wisdom, almost used Sarah Logan on Monday. Because Vince McMahon and WWE have this thought in their head that just because we fired them, they're still getting paid from us, so we can use them whenever we want for the next 90 days, Monday Raw and SmackDown's talent. So, up until a, the la- a last minute change, which Vince McMahon is known for his last minute changes, Sarah Logan was written into the script of Monday Night Raw. Sarah Logan's name was mentioned more times on this, on this show on Monday Night Raw than she has had matches in the last two years. Um, it's just like, what the fuck are they doing? How are you going to have somebody that you just fired? Yes, I know Drake Maverick, you have him in this thing. This championship contenderness, um, contender um, tournament. Which, okay, why did you fire the guy then if you knew he was going to be in the tournament? Or why didn't you just replace him? I'm pretty sure Real Mendoza would have taken that spot if he's not even in the tournament. Or somebody else could have taken that spot. Just why you decided to have Drake Maverick in the tournament, then you fired him. Only to say, well, you know what? We have you in this tournament. We don't have... We really don't want to find anybody else to replace you. So we'll let you finish it out anyway. Leading to a lot of people to speculate that, oh, this guy's still there. Then you take Sarah Logan. And up until the final minutes, right before Raw goes on the air, or probably during Raw, Sarah Logan is in the script. Sarah Logan's going to be there, which Sarah Logan is probably going to be at Monday Night Raw anyway because her husband's there. Even when all this shit goes said and done, Sarah Logan probably is going to be backstage at Raw a couple times anyway because her husband works for Monday for WWE and he's on Monday Night Raw, so why wouldn't she be there? It just, WWE just makes no sense whatsoever sometimes. Just because, it's like, just because they're fired from us, we're still paying them for 90 days, so why not use them? Why not use them? I don't think that's how that works, Vince. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how termination for contracts work with a 90-day no-compete clause, but I'm pretty sure just because when they're fired, that means you cannot fucking use them or you're not supposed to fucking use them. Now, I'm sure what the Drake Maverick thing is, is that they contacted him, released him, but said, you know what, you're, gonna, you're officially released, but we do want you to, to agree to three more dates with us, and that's the way that goes. Now... Next month, which is May, of course, we're coming up with that on Friday, AEW 
is supposedly scrapping everything that's happening after this coming Wednesday's taping. They're going back to Daly's place to work live or taping again. I don't know how that's going to go. A lot of people are already criticizing AEW because the fact that you're going to bring talent in to, and they're going to have 30% more of their roster, apparently. They've only been working with a very select few of their roster, and it's not been easy. The fact that they haven't had a Jungle Boy, a Luchasaurus, the MJF, a SCU, a Young Bucks, even though Young Bucks and SCU have been working on BTE. So they're getting some reps in. But you're not seeing a big roster. And that's another thing that's been hurting AEW and why AEW has been hurting so much is that you're seeing Cody and you're seeing um, Kenny Omega over and over and over again. You're seeing Lance Archer, Luke Harper, I'm sorry, Brody Lee, um, Wardlow. You're seeing all these talents again and again and again. Sheeta, Britt Baker, these seem like the only two main names that they have in the women's division who are working right now. And it sucks. I know it's the pandemic, and you have a lot of these guys who are in hard-hit areas. Like, Rod and Powerful is up in New York. They're not going anywhere for a very long time. The Young Bucks are in SCU. Brandon Cutler are all in California. They're not going anywhere. I think they should have stayed at home. I don't know where the Lucha Bros are. I don't know if they're in Mexico or what. Pax over in the UK. He's not coming over. B Priestley's over in the UK. She's not coming over anytime soon. So, they have been with a very limited roster. They have Marco Stunt, but that's it. They have Marco Stunt, Brody Lee, World Low, um, Lance Archer, a bunch of, a bunch of talent, indie talent from the, from the Georgia area, which is why you've seen Danny Jordan and others on, and it's funny, that's the only one, the only name I can remember. Should be, I think, Pineapple, the Pineapple Guy. Yeah, you've only had like Justin Law and a couple other guys from the independent scene show up on AEW television because they don't have a large amount of rosters. They can't build the storylines. We're still waiting to see Trent and we're still waiting to see Best Friends versus Death Triangle in a parking lot brawl. I wish they would have sat out there during that first episode and taped it. They could have fucking taped that shit that day just so you could have that footage done and boom, you have yourself a match that we could watch later on. But they didn't do that. Why? Because they didn't. So, yes, they're supposed to be going back, and people are already criticizing because it's like, oh, well, it doesn't have a good look for AEW because if you bring talent in who haven't been seen in a while, they can't go back to their families for another two weeks of quarantine. And it's like, that's bullshit. The quarantine, people need to fucking realize that the social distancing thing is a bunch of bullshit lies. It doesn't protect, it doesn't do anything like that. If somebody, if somebody in your family, if you're a family of five, and like your mother or your father goes out to work, or goes out to a store, they can bring COVID back in, and guess what? The entire family's infected. So what the fuck is up with this social distancing bullshit? <laughs> Give me a break. So AEW needs, like, needs to get their roster back. WWE needs to get their roster back. But <laughs> apparently, when it comes to this whole entire thing, WWE, of course, is allowed to be in Florida. AEW is allowed to be in Florida. UFC is allowed to go to Florida as well, simply because Florida governor made national TV. Uh, if you have national TV and you're in athletic sports, you have free reign to work in Florida without a crowd, of course. So the NBA, the NMB, um, MLB, NHL can all come back to New York, can go, all come to Florida and have games there. We'll see what happens with all of that. However... I just don't know what AEW, it's just AEW and all these other tent shows are going to have to sit here and wait to see what happens. I want this stuff to be over. The COVID shit is well overblown, has been since day one. I just want people to realize that you're going to have to deal with it. AEW and WWE need to get crowds back ASAP. Yes, it's great that the last few episodes of AEW's show have had a crowd of sorts with, like, five people on one side, five people on the other, and that is that. But it's not the same as, like, 10 to 15,000 people in a crowd. It's just not. Yes, it's a major difference than having nobody, even though if you are somebody... If you... 
wrestler from Japan. If you're even Kenny Omega, should know how to do this because he's Kenny fucking Omega. He should know how to do this. If you are a wrestler from if you wrestled in Japan for years, you should know how to wrestle in an empty crowd, like in a quiet crowd, because in Japan until recently, they would only react to big moves. They would sit there and they would like just sit there, hands down, quiet. I remember, what was it, two thousand and six, two thousand five. WWE had a show from Japan, and this was the first time I've ever watched a wrestling show from Japan, in Japan, and it was something strange. Having it was, I remember watching, it was Chris Benoit versus Shawn Michaels, and they would do, and they were wrestling a match, and like, when they, they were, they would do a move, and the crowd would cheer, and then they would stand off with each other, and it's like, the crowd's quiet. What the fuck is this? I have never in my life heard this before. And that is what you're experiencing with the WWE. I mean, look at Oscar and Kyrie Sane when they were facing off Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. They know how to work this because they're from Japan. This is what you do in Japan. They know how to liven it up. Other people do not. So, it is... Just something that needs to happen. WWE, AEW, Impact, who's been, who did Rebellion Part 1 this week, which I find this funny. Rebellion was supposed to be Impact Wrestling's next pay-per-view. It was supposed to happen tomorrow, tonight. Tonight, I believe. I believe Rebellion was supposed to be tonight. Could be wrong. Could be last week. Because of everything that's going on, they couldn't do a live pay-per-view in New York completely. Even if, even if the restrictions come back and they could have maybe a crowd somewhere in a different state, New York was going to be off limits for a while. So they decided, what we're going to do instead is we're going to take from a closed set and we're going to do Rebellion for night one, two nights of Rebellion for the next two weeks. This past Tuesday and this coming Tuesday. And people... For whatever fucking reason, decided, oh, well, this is they, that Impact Wrestling copying WWE again. Um, first off, no. WWE, if you want to talk about copying anything, copied New Japan Pro Wrestling, who did two nights in a row for New Wrestle Kingdom first. If I'm correct, Impact Wrestling, even with the crowd, about two, three years ago, did a Destination X TV special for two nights. They did Destination X Night 1, Destination X Night 2, or Week 1 and Week 2. I could be wrong, but people are sitting there and saying, yes, Impact Wrestling, we have known for years, have copied. Even back, back in the day, back when Impact Wrestling was the second hardest company in the world outside the WWE. And there, yes, there was a time when Impact Wrestling was a clear-cut number two. They weren't making money because of... Dixie Carter being an idiot and hiring the wrong people to manage her money. But they were doing, they were a hot product at one time. They always found something to copy WWE. Daniel Bryan becomes the face of, becomes the face of yes, of the yes movement. What do they do in Impact Wrestling? They do Eric Young. They have Eric Young, this goofball character who has, has this guy who's been 95% of his career a goofball character. They have him throw his beard out, and then they have him become World Heavyweight Champion in a match against Nick Aldis, a.k.a. Magnus, who at the time was the most paper champion in Impact in wrestling history. Nick Aldis as NWA World Heavyweight Champion, I have no problem with it. He is looking fine as that. When he won the Impact World Heavyweight Championship um, back in 2000, what was it, uh, 13 or 14, the guy looked like... Shit. They treated him like shit. Not and he he had he won the the way he won the title was shit. The way he lost the title, it's like they had like Nick Aldis beating Eric Young would have been a way to establish him as a dominant heel, beating up on this guy who won a battle royal or won a match to get a title match, and against against Magnus, and it would have been a great way to do that. But no, nope. what did they do? They gave it to Eric Young because they had to copy WWE. Yes, Impact Wrestling wanted to be WWE Light at one time. Even Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman. 
was contacted by Impact Wrestling during his time away from WWE after ECW one after ECW one um, December to December in 2006. Somewhere in between that time and the time he came back, he was contacted by TNA to come in and work and become the head of everything and take TNA into the future. Paul Heyman wanted to go with the youth. He wanted to be a place where the youth can go and he can mold the youth into the next big stars. But Impact Wrestling wanted to become the WWE light that they were for many, many years. It is what it is. That's just how things go. So people wanted, I can understand what people, when, w, when, a, when, N, when Impact Wrestling said, we're going to have Rebellion be a two-night affair, where they say, well, they copied WWE, but nobody wants to mention the fact that in New Japan Pro Wrestling was the first ones to do a two-night event, a two-night pay-per-view for their biggest show of the year. Now, Impact Wrestling did not do their biggest show of the year. That's Bound for Glory in October. If they want to do a two-night Bound for Glory, it wouldn't surprise me. But, yeah. This isn't Impact Wrestling. This wasn't Impact Wrestling copying WWE. I'm pretty sure... I know I'm just going off on a tangent here, but it's something I just want to do. I want to talk, give you guys some entertainment. If you want to laugh and say this guy sounds like an idiot, then you do that. But... WWE and, and all these other things, crowds make a difference. They really, really do. How many times have we been on Twitter and we've seen people it's like, man, why is this crowd so dead? Why, like, you have, you have Rey Mysterio going out there with Andrade giving you a bun burner of the match and the crowd is crickets. Why? Why? It, I'd rather have a crowd there than have no crowd at all. Now, it's funny because, as we know, right before WWE decided they were going to go live again before changing back to saying we're going to go tape to live, live to tape, that they came oh so close to being shut down by the Florida government, by the Florida authorities. Apparently, that was a, an anonymous, an anonymous source in WWE, an anonymous um, employee in WWE, who called the authorities to get the the, the taping shut down because they did not want to work during this pandemic because this person is a sheep who believes the government. Government, Which, by the way, I saw something on my local news yesterday where they had this little, like, this bar that goes through, and it said, and, and the poll, there was a poll out there that people actually believe, like, trust their governors in, in this time of the pandemic. I'm like, are you fucking stupid? Anyway. But WWE, as we know, they got their, uh, they got the ability to get a free pass. They are essential to Florida, which, and here's the thing. The Florida governor says they are essential to the Florida economy. Is anybody in this close set from Florida? Or any of these workers working in this close set, are they from the Florida co um, coast or anything? Or are these all WWE paid employees? Because if they're all WWE paid employees, I don't know how this is helping the Florida economy. Now, when they open up, back, it's like if you take away the crowd, you take away the fans and say no crowd can be there, then how is this helping Florida? Now, when the games open back up, if you want to do a whole social distancing, which is the AKA crowd control, you want to do this, you don't have to have a full stadium of crowd, a full stadium crowd. Look at your football stadiums. Look at your basketball arenas. Look at what hockey plays too, which is also basketball arenas. Look at golf doesn't need fucking um, fans. I'm telling you that right now. Horse racing apparently is still going on. But it's like, look at where, like, say, the Chicago Bulls play, the United Center. That thing is huge. You could probably have 10 people on... The, on the camera side, 10 people on the other side spread out enough to where they could be socially distanced, but you have a fucking crowd. Like, if you had WrestleMania at Raymond James Stadium, you could have probably put 10, like, a, like 100 people in there, spread them out enough to where they're six feet apart. Hell, you could probably put 200 people in there where they're all spread out six feet apart, and you could have had a little bit of a crowd, but there would, you would have been obeying social distancing guidelines, which, by the way, guidelines are not the fucking law. 
I'm just saying. So, what else do I want to talk about this week? Hmm. Let's see. Things are just getting crazy. I'm hoping, like, Vin like Vince McMahon losing his, ta his stack. I'm not surprised whatsoever. Vince McMahon losing his mind. Not surprised whatsoever. We are, it is what it is coming up soon. WWE has got to get things under control or they're going to lose a lot of fans. I honestly think WWE and AEW are pushing fans away more than they know. Because you got to think about this. You have at least two months, or at least a month and a half, of empty arena shows. Yes, AEW's tried by having fans, like having wrestlers in this, on, on the signs, making some noise, but it's never going to substitute a live crowd. Takeovers. I, I like to put this out here. NXT TakeOver. Every single NXT TakeOver has been sold out, or at least close to sold out, with a massive hot crowd. Now imagine watching NXT TakeOver Portland this past February with, oh like, no, 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 I'm think. NXT TakeOver Philadelphia, Johnny Gargano versus Andrade Cien Almas. That match, that crowd, that night, five star match. Now you wipe the crowd away. No crowd noise, no crowd whatsoever. You have that match from spot to spot, start to finish how it went. It would still be a damn good match, but it wouldn't feel as important. Why? Because the crowd makes part, is part of the show. It's 50% at least. If you have, like, if you take Johnny Gargano versus um, Andrade and you put a, not, not that hot crowd, but you put a dead Monday Night Raw crowd during that show, it would still be a great match, but the show, but the match would still suffer because the crowd had their hands, had their hands, uh, sat on their hands and didn't do anything for the entire night. So, anyone saying, oh, well, they're making it work as best they can. No, they're not. There's nothing you can do to make this work until you get crow a crowd back into here. These shows are going to suffer, and we as fans are going to suffer because the crowd is not there, and the crowd needs to be there for us to actually, it, like, the enjoyment of the show, just like Otis getting that, Otis versus Dolph Ziggler at WrestleMania. If you pack a hundred and like eighty six thousand people in the Raymond James Stadium, everybody's behind Otis. Everybody's behind Otis. They want him to get the girl, especially after what happened the front two the, the night before or two nights before. I don't remember if it was on Friday or Saturday or Sunday. But you saw what happened with the masked fit the the, the spies who exposed the plot between Sony Deville and Dolph Ziggler. To Mandy Rose and Otis, and Otis beats Dolph Ziggler, gets the girl in his arms, and plants and she plants that kiss on him. Why that need like that in front of a full blown crowd? That would have been a WrestleMania moment for the ages. This year's WrestleMania, unfortunately, is going to be one of those WrestleManias that when you see the WrestleMania moments. Over the years, as we see, this will be a WrestleMania. We don't see that whatsoever. We don't. We just won't. Because you see Hulk Hogan slamming Andre with that crowd going ballistic. You see Austin stunning Michaels as Mike Tyson counts for one, two, three with that massive crowd. You see TLC, um, I'm sorry, the Triangle Ladder Match or TLC 2, whatever it was. At WrestleMania with a huge crowd when Edge, I think it was at WrestleMania, one was at WrestleMania where Edge speared Jeff Hardy. That, if that was at WrestleMania, and yes, having those crowds. And then you see Otis lock lips with Mandy Rose to a crowd of zero. It just won't feel the same. And then, of course, as we know, SoFi Stadium, which is going to be with the home of the Los Angeles Rams and the Los Angeles Chargers, is supposed to be the host of WrestleMania 2037 coming up next year. The California governor, as I mentioned last week, an idiot as he is, is possibly going to disallow large events going into next year, which will be after WrestleMania, because WrestleMania is actually going to be in March next year. 
So WWE, unlike this year, which had about weeks to plan what the hell they were going to do because they weren't going to have WrestleMania in Raymond James Stadium, what were they going to do? Well, boom, they went to the Performance Center. They're already thinking contingency plans for next year. But WrestleMania has got to have a crowd next year. But what is people? But one thing that people are talking about is that WrestleMania did this year, Triple H agrees with, and Triple H would like to see. Triple H was on the After the Bell this past week on Thursday, and talked to Corey Graves and said that WrestleMania, from here on out, should be two nights. Two nights. Which, if it's going to be in a Madison Square Garden or a TD Garden or some nice big um, arena. I'm all for it. Two nights, WrestleMania, fine. It's going to be kind of hard to sell two nights in SoFi Stadium or two nights at Raymond James Stadium, which is probably WrestleMania 38 is going to go. People have seen articles coming out that WrestleMania 37 is going to be one night and one night only. If it goes on at SoFi Stadium with a huge crowd of 87,000 whatever, then it's going to be one night. Why? Because when SoFi Stadium got the rights or the got the rights to WrestleMania 37 to go Hollywood, they made they they got the rights for one night only. WWE already has that contract signed, sealed, delivered to them. Though if they want to get a second night at SoFi Stadium, they would have to go back to the drawing board. They have to go back to the negotiation table because. They have to rent out SoFi Stadium for a second night. So, and I'm pretty sure that is they're not going to get the well. You bought it, you sold, you rented it out for the for Sunday. We'll give it, we'll give you Saturday for free. That's not going to happen. At the performance center, they can do whatever the hell they want because it's their performance center. But you're going to a, somebody else's arena and paying big money. They're paying big money for you to come here, or you're paying big money to go there. They're going to want more money for that second night. So when they go back to Raymond James Stadium, probably at WrestleMania 38, which is probably where they're going to go, which is if that's true, why didn't they just change their WrestleMania 36 logos and everything? You had weeks to do that. You could have changed that all within a week. If you gave a graphics artist, one of those ones who are out there go, doing graphics for content creators all over YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter, and whatnot, I guarantee you, if you would have gave them a week, they could have came up with a new WrestleMania 36 um, logo and graphics package for the PC Mania that it was. So you could have left all the stuff that you had for WrestleMania 36 and kept it because there's no 30 because after WrestleMania 30, WWE and Vince McMahon took the numbers off of WrestleMania. He thinks he can think it makes WrestleMania seem old. He doesn't want old old. In WWE, which is why he doesn't want to be on television, even though he has The Undertaker, Goldberg, and other, and Brock Lesnar, and others being on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown. Triple H as well, Shawn Michaels, which, what the fuck was going on with Shawn Michaels' beard on Friday? Because it looked like someone pissed on it and it just stood there. It was so ugly looking. But, so... It's not like it said WrestleMania 36 in the graphic, so it could have been repurposed for WrestleMania 38, and nobody would have known the difference. So the question is, if they go back to Wrestle to Raymond James Stadium for WrestleMania 38, what are they gonna do? They already fucking spent the pirate theme on the PC. What would they do? Who the fuck knows? Now, yes, as we said before, they are also like the contingency plans for. WrestleMania 37 are being looked at in case they can't go to SoFi Stadium because one, it being delayed, which it looks like that might be happening, and two, because the governor of California is an idiot and thinks that by this time next year we won't be able to have and we won't be able to have large crowds in California until next year, which again, you're a fucking idiot. So. I think that if WWE is going to go with a contingency plan, I think Vegas would be good. If Vegas allows large like crowds and stuff, they got that new stadium where the Raiders play, or where the Raiders are going to play this year. I'm sure Vegas would love to have WrestleMania in that that new venue. 
I think WrestleMania would look great in that venue. They would have to hold off Hollywood till WrestleMania 39, which wouldn't be a problem. That'd be in 2023. Or 2020, yeah, 2023. Yeah, 2023. Which you would have Vegas, Tampa Bay, Hollywood. Not a problem there. WWE has, at least, at least this time, they have time to work on it in time. But, of course, knowing WWE, they'll probably wait till last minute and be like, Oh, well, we can't go to SoFi Stadium, so we have to go back to the Performance Center. But this time, we'll have a crowd there. WWE just, I, I don't know. I just don't fucking know. This, this, I can't wait till this shit is over. Vince McMahon, I think, has cracked under the pressure. What we saw on, apparently what we saw on Saturday, on Friday, was Vince McMahon backstage and how he's been lately. Which, with everything that's going on, I wouldn't blame him. I wouldn't blame him cracking. I'm, I'm not, I'm not under any pressure like that because I don't have a multi-billion dollar corporation that I work on. And I didn't just try to start up a, a football league, which if I had the money, I would buy the XFL from him just to have the property. But I don't, I'm just saying. But... Unscripted for April 26, 2020 is in the books. Hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video. If you like what I say, if you like what I'm talking about, let me know in the comment section below. I, if you don't like what I say, let me know in the comment section below, and we'll say about that later. But I'm getting out of here. Find me on Twitter at the France Club. Find me on Twitch.tv slash the France Club. Find me on Instagram at the France Club, and I will see you guys. Tuesday, hopefully Monday, but I don't know. I'm waiting for this goddamn stimulus thing to come through so I can get things figured out. But until then, my name is Bronson, and I'll see you guys later.